Okay, so once again, a warm welcome to everyone uh, joining our session. Um, I am uh, Claire Lucia Leifert, um, Head of the Impact and Innovation Lab at the German Council on Foreign Relations and one of your two hosts today. Um, and uh, Dina um, is uh, my co-host, co-facilitator and um, uh, co-speaker also uh, with a lot of knowledge on um, monitoring, evaluation and learning for think tanks. Um, and she's also co-producer, so we are taking turns here today. And uh, she may pop up and then also read the chat for you and um, whatever you write, as long as I'm talking, I'm going to do the same uh, thing um, when, when, she's, when it's her turn to speak. Um, so this session is actually a cooperation between uh, the second OTT online conference, which you're all attending, have been attending the past three days, and the web event series, Digital Think Tanking in Times of COVID-19. We started, the, we started the digital think tanking series in April, shortly after the first OTT online conference, when many think tanks worldwide uh, suddenly found themselves in the home office and were forced to move their entire operations online. We covered topics from how to bring face-to-face -face events online to breaking through the noise of misinformation in the COVID crisis and many more. We, that is uh, the German Council on Foreign Relations, and the Think Tank Com Communications Community, WOMCOMS, and the Design and Digital Agency, Soapbox. And of course, many experts from the Think Tank community who uh, shared their tips. You can find recordings of all um, events in the expo session, actually, of uh, the on Think Tanks um, conference. Um, so today's topic, um, is uh, called Beyond Crisis Management, Adapting Your Impact Strategy Through Organizational Learning. Uh, many think tanks, um, as, yeah, as, as we all know, have had to adapt their work considerably due to the pandemic and the lockdown. And these changes included the introduction of remote work for staff, uh, changing the research focus to account for disruptive political change, translating face-to-face -face activities into online formats or postponing them, among others. The changed circumstances offer new opportunities, but also challenges with regard to the impact we can have on our audiences and on policy processes and outcomes. How can we know what our audiences need now, what impact we have on them and on policy, and how can we actually go about this remotely? Um, today in the session, we want to discuss how to monitor progress and uh, on, on progress on and changes to our impact strategies in this special time of crisis and how we can actually use the crisis as a moment for organizational learning and adaptive management to become more resilient in the future because after the crisis is before the crisis and of course also how to do all this remotely. We were hoping to have um, a third speaker today on our panel who is an expert in um, digital uh, technologies um, for uh, for MEL, but unfortunately she broke her uh, jaw and uh, will thus not be able to to join us. But we will try to make up for it, and we're also very curious to learn from all of you um, what your experiences have been. Um, yeah, so why organizational learning? Um, learn despite the crisis. Um, yeah, two reasons actually. Learning despite the crisis and learning from the crisis. Um, learning despite the crisis in the sense that you should not put it on hold if you've done it before. It's critical for your organization's survival. And learning from the crisis, of course, because first of all, your impact strategy that you might have uh, made up in January or last year even may not make sense anymore under the changed circumstances. And also, organizational learning will make you more resilient for future crises to come. Um, learning despite the crisis, what does that mean? So political processes are always complex, uh, but in the crisis, our environment is changing quickly and more profoundly. And um, we all know probably this dilemma to be caught between a, a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, you have this like beautiful annual strategy that you laid out that everybody finds beautiful, but in the time of crisis, it affords you with no flexibility if you try to push all the deliverables through that you were planned. 
On the other hand, um, if there's crisis and you haven't really had a plan or you just see it's not uh, doable at all, um, you um, start to just be able to react to things, to short-term needs. And it's just like a, a total crisis mode all the time, um, working from day to day instead of like long-term agenda setting. So the question for all of us is, of course, and we don't have the solution here, but we want to offer like a way to think about this, is um, uh, to how we can actually find a sweet spot in the middle. And we think that um, constant organizational reflection helps us to um, have um, an agile management approach to planning and to, to monitoring our progress. And this can help us with or without crisis. And um, when it comes to learning from the crisis, um, actually, I wanted to uh, take up an example from yesterday that was mentioned by Jess White from the RSA in the session, How Does Change Happen? And I'm sure that some of you uh, were there yesterday. It was actually perfect, perfect um, uh, start uh, also for our um, conversation here today. So uh, she just uh, introduced this framework from the RSA for collective sense making to learn from the crisis and the crisis response measures that were taken or are being taken at the moment in different communities, institutions, policies. And of course, having something like this framework and apply it to your own work um, or to your own fields of work. This um, is a perfect example for how you can learn from the crisis. So how are we going to go about our session here today? Um, we will um, have a short introduction. And actually, we would like to start by asking all of you to uh, write your uh, names and organizations in the chat. And also, and um, I will check if we have the poll up already. Um, so can you see? Can you see that? I'm not sure. Can you see a poll? Mm. Okay, whatever. So um, it would be great if all of you could just uh, put your names and your organizations in the chat so we can see who's actually joining us. I can see we're 23 people in the room now, but we cannot see you. So it would be great to just know who's around. Great, Laura, you made a good start. Everyone else joining in. So this is the start. Um, so we see a bit, a bit better what like different perspectives we have around the virtual table here. We will uh, start in a minute with two reflections, one from, from Dina, who will give us an overview and introduction to organizational learning. And um, then I will follow up with like a case study from my own organization, which is not to say that we've all figured out, uh, figured it all out, but it's more as like a starter for our conversation later with all of you. And I'm sure that many of you can also share their uh, experiences. Of course, you will have the, the possibility to um, ask questions to both of us. So please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat while we are talking and we will take them up later. And there's also the, the technical possibility to, um, to join, um, uh, join a conversation um, uh, via chat. Um, but, uh, via video, and for this you have to re uh, request video, but um, it's also not uh, just if you want to, um, you can also just um, uh, uh, ask your question in the chat, of course. Um, as um, a next point, we want to, um, of course, um, have a, a bit more of a collaborative approach to share our experiences. We will uh, tell you more later how we will go about this, and we will talk about strengths and challenges of remote organizational learning. And uh, take the survey. This is yellow because I wasn't sure if we we're going to have one. I think we don't have one right now. It doesn't matter. And of course, join the join a community of practice. So um, this is not only uh, the last uh, session in our uh, series um, on digital think tanking for now, at least before the summer break, but this is also the start of something new um, because um, we uh, will start uh, with this a community of practice uh, of uh, think tankers from around the world to take this conversation about organizational learning and think tanks further. Um, and of course, also feel free to live tweet um, using the hashtags OTT Conference Digital Think Tanking. And 
And uh, with this, I would like my co-host, uh, Dina, to introduce herself. So hi, everybody. Um, I think you can hear me and see me. I hope so. Um, thanks for coming to our session today. So I'm Dina Lemovsky from Southern Hemisphere. I am, as Luke Claire Louisa said, a primarily an evaluator and I help organizations with organizational learning systems and processes. And I've um, been working with think tanks for, for quite a few years now. And I really wish I was with all of you live we could catch up. And I've been pretending that I'm at a conference and eating loads of biscuits today. So <laughs> simulation. And coffee. <laughs> and coffee. Too much coffee. <laughs> Great. So for me, I mean, I really wanted this is just a takeaway quote. Learning is a muscle to be developed. People in think tanks have to be comfortable with discussing learning, failure and improvement. And so I'm going to introduce kind of the idea of learning in a learning organization and some tools and tips for doing that. And then Claire will give us some practical examples of what they've done in her organization. So, ooh, Claire, I think. What's going on is a different version of the slide. Uh, I had another slide. Okay, I'll just talk to it. Um, so I had a slide. The next slide on my set is what is a learning organization? So I don't know if mm -hmm. you've had the previous version. Okay, one second. One second. Um, I'll share it with you in the chat. No worries. Can, no. Everyone can have it as well in your chat there. No. Okay. No worries, we'll have okay. the new one. All right, so basically, what is a learning organization? A learning organization, I mean, there's many definitions, but the one that I found that resonates with me is, funny enough, from Harvard Business uh, Review, is a learning organization is an organization which is skilled at creating, acquiring, and transferring knowledge, and at modifying its behavior to reflect new knowledge and insights. So the key there is really... Um, modifying its behavior. Um, so let's typically, I think evaluation and monitoring has been about accountability and then also increasingly learning. Um, accountability is linked to the results based paradigm where organizations such as your own or think tanks find themselves in tight contractual relationships with funders, limited core funding, uh, project work, uh, limited flexibility, and you end up using your monitoring and evaluation to prove uh, that you are doing what you said you would do. Um, does this sound familiar? You can answer yes or no in the chat. I'm sure for many of you, it, it's a sound quite familiar. Um, but learning is about using information that you have to improve. It, it poses a different question to accountability, which poses, you know, um, how do we show that we did what we said we would do? And for learning, the question is more, how do we make sure that we are implementing appropriate strategies? Do you want me to show the next slide, Dina? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, Sorry. so there we go. So there's this dichotomy set up between accountability and learning. And in fact, there are different questions that we're asking. Um, so it's not so much about proving what you did, but in fact, it's showing that you're able to navigate um, change and adapt to your context and your resources and your environment and so on. So, so given the current environment with COVID, um, a learning organization will be asking, do our impact strategies still make sense? Um, should we be doing something different or differently? Um, and should we be changing our direction even? Um, so the question I think that many people are asking in the, in the kind of evaluation world is, can you actually be truly accountable without learning? Okay, so can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Irene Chait, uh, one of the thinkers in the evaluation sector, asked, um, said the, the tug of war between learning and accountability is nonsensical. They need each other. Understanding effectiveness requires both. Because actually, quite honestly, if you can't, if you're not learning, then you're, you're creating waste. You may be making the same mistakes over and over again. 
and wasting resources. So in fact, it's dishonest and it's not authentic. And I think that's what we're really striving for, at least in, in this decade. Um, so, and as Southern Hemisphere, we understand learning to be part of a cycle where, you know, you begin with defining it's quadrant A on the top right, or you begin by having a clear idea of what it is that you want to achieve, your program definition, your goal, your design. And this, you can use various tools such as theory of change, outcome mapping, uh, logical framework, and you have a clear design, you know where you want to go. Once you have your design, you then need to measure and gather data or to describe what you've been doing and have the evidence that you need to be able to learn, right? So that learning is the next step where you're interrogating what the evidence you have, you're analyzing it, you're sense making, and you're reporting and on using your reflection processes. And then once you've done that, it's really important to close the feedback loop and then use it to improve your findings and your insights, which then go back into redesigning or redefining. Now, this can be a short loop, it can be from one workshop to the next, one event to the next, one research project to the next, where you, you know, you're having maybe after action review, some kind of informal processes, or it could be long cycle for your whole project or your whole program, perhaps you know, three year evaluate planning and evaluation cycle, for example. So, but it gets built into your organizational processes. Okay, um, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, all right, so why is this idea of adaptation, um, flexibility, particularly attractive and appropriate for think tanks? Well, we know that the very context that you work in is unpredictable, that policy influencing process itself is often very uncertain, you know, stakeholders change, you know, have an election and all your relationships are gone and things change and people change. So it's really unpredictable environment. And in fact, you know, a lot of the theories around policy engagement are about being policy entrepreneurs and going with the flow and grabbing the windows of opportunity as they arrive and being flexible. Um, navigating by judgment is a kind of a newish term that's entered this, this sphere where it's actually about the people on the ground, the people who are doing the, the actual engagement with the, with, the, uh, with the interface with the policymakers, with, the, with getting the feedback who are going to have to make those decisions. If you're at a conference and a door opens, an opportunity opens, how are you going to grab it? How are you going to go for it? Um, so, so it really is about changing this idea of top-down management to more bottom-up management, empowering the people who are engaging and who are implementing to make decisions as they need to, to, to maximize their impact. And um, so I think for a lot of think tanks, it's quite, especially the older ones, I suppose, it's more challenging. You've got strict hierarchies. The people at the top are very well respected. You know, they might carry a lot of status. Um, how do you shift this on its head to you empower uh, everyone in the organization to be thinking critically all the time, to be making judgments, to be taking decisions um, and not waiting for the, you know, we write a report, it goes to the head, it takes six months until the decision is made, it comes back down to us, we can then implement, we have permission. How do you create a dynamic a learning culture? Um, so, yeah, some, one of the, some of the questions that came out yesterday was, you know, what ways have you found useful in your organization to stimulate review and reflection to some of the things that, that we think about? So, but what does it actually require? If you want everyone in your organization to be thinking critically, it's, in our world, as we talk about evaluative thinking, right? So evaluative thinking is a way of thinking that is underpinned by dialogue, reflection, learning and improving. It's where evaluation is not seen purely as an assessment or an inquiry or an accountability mechanism. Actually, where the notion of evaluation is supported and viewed as an opportunity to learn and improve. And where we, everyone in the organization is comfortable with evaluation to embrace it as part of the organizational culture. And it, it's funny that this is, you know, we think about think tanks are super critical about the world around us, right? That's basically yes. the job. <laughs> That's all Probably all of you agree, right? <laughs> so we always know better. We know better than policymakers and <laughs> the public anyways. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, oh gosh, Damien's saying that this, it, something's happened to him right now. The, the policymaker who you had a relationship with has just disappeared. So now you've got to now what, right? It happens all the time. 
Okay, so, so as think tanks, we critically engage with the world around us, but what we're saying and requiring is use, apply that skill to yourself. So you need to critically engage with your own work processes and outcomes. Are they the right outcomes? Are they still right, given our context? And are we doing the right things to achieve that with the right people? Is it affecting anyone negatively? What are the knock-on effects of, of our situation? Um, and so on. So, you know, you, for example, you have your theory of change. It sets out what you want to do. But you should be critically asking, and this is actually the point of a theory of change, it is just a theory, where you are expected to ask, are our assumptions correct? Uh, what are mm -hmm. the hypotheses underlying this? theory of change mm -hmm. and, and how do we test them how do we know if they're taking us in the right direction or if we made false mm -hmm. assumptions to start with so that's the critical engagement that you need to be doing all the time okay um so if we could go to the next so, so, so okay so easier said than done <laughs> with busy you know there's lots of constraints i mean all the think tanks i work with you know people are multitasking you're doing research you're running events you're attending conferences, you're networking. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a kind of a crazy, crazy environment. So co three common constraints to organizational learning, which we hear a lot are, we haven't got the capacity, we don't know how, or we, we don't know how have anyone to lead it. We, we don't have time. Um, and our organizational culture isn't necessarily one that uh, can encourage this. So what can you do then to, uh, what are some of the things that, think tanks can do and I kind of boiled it down for now to three key things um, the one is you need some kind of a framework okay so to give the organization some capacity some some knowledge of where it's going with this a framework for learning is really useful so a good starting point is your theory of change if you've got a log frame a log frame whatever you use your outcome map you'll know it's fine from that you draw your learning agenda. What are our evaluative questions? What is it that we really want to test through our work? And from there you can draw, draw a learning agenda, which everyone knows it's transparent, it can be agreed upon and discussed upon, and it can set the framework for learning. The second thing you need- What is the, uh, may I interrupt you? So maybe not everyone is familiar with the term learning agenda. So, so what is a learning agenda? A learning agenda is, is essentially what are your key questions that you want to focus the organizational learning around. And typically it is drawn out of the assumptions or out of the um, links in your, in your theory of change. So for your, your assumption, if we um, have strong relationships with these policymakers um, and we, we engage them in this way, it will lead to them adopting this recommendation that comes out of our research. So the learning agenda would be, um, are we engaging policymakers in the right way? Um, are we attracting the right people to the table? Um, uh, what are what are the barriers and obstacles to adapt, adapt to uptake that we are encountering in our work? So it's it's asking you to critically engage with the process as it unfolds, but also with the outcomes, right? Um, so that's a learning. It's a you can. There's some resources that I'm happy to share with you. Um, there's a quite a nice mm -hmm. InTrack actually document that I found recently. If you search for InTrack, um, I'll find the link for you and put it in the chat later to how to develop right. these questions. Okay, so the, the next step is you need evidence, right? So we're not learning, uh, we're learning from statistics, whatever stats you're gathering in your work, number of downloads, and how long are people staying on your site? And John will know all of those, reading three seconds to read your documents and so on. Um, stories, stories of change, um, outcome harvesting, most significant change, nice qualitative techniques for, for gathering stories of change and learning about how change happens. And then also, of course, practitioner experience. All of you, each and every one of you has loads of experience. You know instinctively, uh, you know, what's working, what's not working, and you need to be adapting as you go along. So, and given opportunity is the final thing, opportunity to reflect both informal and informal spaces. So for learning and reflection. So informal spaces, as I said earlier, something like an after action review, or it could be a quick meeting, and then more formal through formal evaluation and so on. But what is critical, and, and for learning, as I said earlier, learning is a muscle to be developed so that people in the organization have to become comfortable with discussing learning, failure, and improvement. But this can only work in an environment of trust, right? Without trust, 
um, people are not going to be vulnerable. They're not going to make themselves open to reflection, maybe in a small team, but not necessarily organization wide. So that's a really important point. Okay, so what are some of the tools um, that you can use to, to do this when you're working virtually? So for example, if you were face to face with your team, you, you'd want to do some collaboration, design, sense making, decision making, you'd get together in a room and, and you, you would discuss that. But now we have to use things like Zoom and there are many collaborative tools which are available which you can do uh, interactive thinking. So whiteboard tools, mind mapping, concept boards, sticky notes for kind of divergent thinking, getting ideas out there, discussing them. And then there's some the nice tools for bringing ideas together, polls, you can voting apps, all sorts of things where you can do some more convergent thinking. Um, really nice. We've been doing thinking pairs at our organization using Nancy Klein's Time to Think. You know, every week we match different people up and set a question. Um, it's seven, only five minutes aside, and it's really people really are appreciating that connection. Um, evaluation and research. So usually you would do face-to-face -face interviews and focus groups, and of course we can shift virtually now. We can you know use Skype or we can use Zoom to do interviews, WhatsApp calls, voice notes. We can uh, do virtual workshops, even vir virtual focus groups in this kind of a forum, for example. Um, or Zoom where you can do breakout rooms and you can have, you do Google Docs as flip charts. So there's various ways of running virtual sessions. Um, monitoring and storing evidence. Well, you know, we would have a shared drive at work typically. Now what we want to do is make sure that's accessible. Yeah, Menti is great app for voting. Uh, Mural is a super one for, um, I also really like Mural. And if you, if you join in as their consultant network, they give you free licenses and gifts to give away. <laughs> Um, auto transcription, great. Keep the ideas coming. We'll collate them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, participants are joining in here. John saying that he also really likes Mural um, yeah. and Menti and also Otter AI for auto transcription. That's also new to me. Yeah, new to me as well. So that's fantastic. So you want to make sure that your your evidence box that you've got, you know, where you can dump all your evidence. So that you know that policymaker wrote you an email and invited you to come to that meeting. What you're going to do with it? You're going to have an evidence box. We call it. You can dump in it. So you just have some kind of cloud space, some kind of shared drive where you can put the evidence in. And web gathering forms, you know, Survey Monkey, Google Forms, ways to gather information. And of course, there's also um, on think tanks very own tool for uh, online web interface uh, for activity and outcome tracker, which is a really nice, simple tool which we developed for IFAD, which is available for adaptation if anyone's interested in it. And then for online collaboration around qualitative data, we, we, we used in vivo in our organization, but it's licensed to a particular laptop. And now we're having to, to collaborative uh, remote uh, qualitative data. So we're using moving to cloud-based solutions such as Deduce, and then for quantitative, there's something like Kobo, Toolbox, and so on. So you can move to cloud-based solutions. So having said that, it's all possible. Whatever you do offline, you can do online. But I think it's really important to remember that we might all be in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. So you know your stakeholders, the people you want to engage, even people in, in different offices. If you're an international think tank or you work, you've got country offices, for example, we, we might have, people might be working from home in cramped working and living conditions. Um, they might have electricity outages. We, have, we had a workshop, amazing online on outcome harvesting workshop last week and the one participant kept, we said, what's going on? She says, no, my electricity's out, so I keep switching devices. <laughs> so she used her son's you know, laptop until it ran out of battery and then she logged in with her laptop until it ran out of battery. And, so it's stressful and it's much easier to get everyone in a five-star hotel. You know, you know, the generator is going to work, the tea and coffee is going to be served. Um, but there's, there's lots of different challenges. Um, so you've got low bandwidth, people are using old devices. I mean, how many of you now are here on a cell phone, for example, that you won't be able to participate in our interactive session just now? Um, yeah, so if anyone, good hint, uh, Dina, so if any one of you, if you have the chance to get on a desktop um, a computer or a laptop, it will be much easier for the second part uh, to participate in our second part of this um, session, because we will use some of the tools that we have uh, spoken about now. Um, well, just the basic ones. <laughs> um, yeah, so what else? So. Um, 
low bandwidth yeah low old devices uh, child care responsibilities uh, you know my people might be caring for sick family members and, and have other kinds of family responsibilities so i think there's a very important to remember that there's a lot of diversity in this space um, and of course, always to to be to be cognizant of that. And if we don't think about it, then we're only privileging those who have access. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's something that's just to, to keep in mind. So, but don't let that get in your way. There's ways around it. Keep learning despite the crisis. Don't put it on hold. It is critical for your organization's survival. Uh, learning from the crisis. You know, you will have to adapt your impact strategy. And maybe there's things that are making better sense now um than they were before and i think hopefully we'll also have learned ways or new ways of learning and adapting um and maybe those are, there's some things that you'd like to keep going forward into the future that are working better for you um yeah so i think from me i would like to give claire the opportunity to show how her organization has actually adapted and used some amazing tools and techniques to promote encourage organizational learning yeah, thanks, Tina. So uh, as I said uh, earlier, so this is just a one case study and it's just a, a conversation opener really to learn more about um, your um, your approaches and your organizations. So just like a little bit of uh, background, um, I'm working at the German Council on Foreign Relations, which is a foreign policy think tank in Berlin. It um, has around like 75 staff and we have like very different forms of funding, project based, institutional funding, membership fees, and as probably all of you we've all uh, had like set out our perfect plans and strategies work plans deliverables for this year we have so many different partners that we have to negotiate our plans with so this all has to happen um you know way beforehand and then you know COVID hit and uh, and we weren't prepared um, so what we did um, in terms of adjusting and, as I said earlier, trying to learn from the crisis and the, despite the crisis, and yeah, you, you've, you'll hear that uh, more often today, um, uh, is a couple of things. And um, so now when I was preparing this session, I prepared this slide and of course it looks much more neat than it was in reality, as it's often the case. So it was not that we had all this like learning agenda um, as um, as Dina explained, like all set out um, before COVID hit, but it was more like learning by doing and just thinking, okay, what do we need to know? What do we need to monitor to be sure that we do not um, miss out on any important information about our projects, about our staff, about our impact, about our target groups. So what we did, for example, uh, was um, when it comes, and, and I've structured this around uh, the, the different parts of a theory of change that you might be uh, familiar with. So of course, it's uh, the most important asset. We had that yesterday as well as people, people, people. So it was important for us to monitor staff well-being in a home office and also encourage peer learning on good practices, how to cope with a crisis. And for this, we did an online survey and shared the results with everyone. We also had, of course, to monitor financial risks, like to see if there are any um, projects that uh, due to um, the crisis might be discontinued or which cannot deliver um, and, the, and that, that might you know, uh, have consequences for the budget. So we also hear that an online survey internally. But then, of course, it's also about like what uh, learning with others, learning with other think tanks. And uh, together with uh, Soapbox and OneComs, I mentioned we set up this uh, web series. Um, and it has been very interesting for us as well as an institution to just see how other think tanks are learning when it comes to digital think tanking, because also this has been an immense learning curve for all of us. Like many people had never used Zoom before March 2020, and all of a sudden we're on Zoom 24-7. Um, also, we encourage sharing work in progress in internal staff meetings. Um, and uh, to amplify new competencies also. So every time we have a staff meeting, for example, a different department um, shares um, something that they have um, done new, that they have learned about like digital tools, about online events and so on. We also created a lot of how-to guidelines, virtual um, method breakfast, that's just our take on like knowledge transfer meetings or door fixes. 
Um, and we also created an, a database of internal experts on various digital tools because I don't know how it is in your organizations, but of course, these kinds of situations as we have right now, they create a big strain of, uh, uh, on our IT colleagues. But we have like just one, we had one, now we have two. Um, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not possible for them to handle everything. So our first um, thing we did was to just ask in this online survey, ask everyone, okay, what do you know and which tools are you familiar with and do you feel comfortable like helping out colleagues? And, uh, and this is how we decentralized uh, the internal expertise without saying, of course, it's, it's not a perfect system yet, but we're working on it. And um, when it comes to outcome, uh, and this is also outcome with an impact, this is what we're also going to focus more on um, in our session today, is also, of course, to monitor changes in our target groups' environments and in the needs they might have. So, for example, it might be that policymakers that you're working on, like they, they are not working on the topics anymore that they worked on before, but their priorities might have changed to like COVID response, for example. And they might not have any attention left for migration or, um, or yeah, anything else than public health, maybe, or economy. So uh, this is always a good way to, to stay in touch with them and like see what they need now from you. Also in terms of um, interaction, of course, like do they want more online meetings or are, are they already having like webinar fatigue? So this is always important to stay in touch. And when it comes to impact, um, yeah, we, we try to and try to still um, to encourage learning from the crisis individually with all our staff members, but also on departmental and organizational level and to build awareness also for the opportunities and competencies gained so the positive aspects of uh, of the crisis if you will and this yeah. is a process that yeah can you hear so me there, yeah so there's a comment um, suggesting mm -hmm. that perhaps it's better not to have too many tools like people might be confused like is it better to rationalize Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So I think I, I will say something more about this. This is absolutely a lesson that we learned um, when it comes to a specific workshop, for example, like really think through like if your uh, if your participants, are they digital natives or not? Um, which tools do they usually work with? Are they even allowed to use Zoom, for example? That's been a big issue with our uh, with our stakeholders because um, you know that in Europe we have the uh, general data protection um, rules from the European Commission. And um, we have to see um, uh, what 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 is actually um, legally allowed for them to do. Um, to to use Zoom, for example, has been complicated for policymakers in in Germany. Um, yes, so this is just like a, a quick overview um, of what we did in terms of organizational learning on the different aspects of our strategy. And um, what I want to talk more about is the mid-year review. Um, uh, that that we did to actually um, yeah talk about our uh, impact and and have this like common reflection on where we are where we are standing in terms of the impact we want to create and what what's the what's the what's the changes that COVID brought about for us so we we had a guiding question for a reflection for the whole organization um, and this is what we started with um, in June early June so this is pretty fresh pretty fresh reflection here. Um, so uh, the question was, how has COVID-19 changed the conditions and impact of our work? And then we had like a three-step uh, reflection process. We had, um, we had, we, we get this question and like a, a framework, um, like a template into the departments. We asked them to prepare to reflect together in their teams. Then we had an all house workshop where all departments came together, they pitched their um, thoughts, and then we also uh, um, enabled um, cross departmental exchange, like self organized exchange. I'll say more about this. This, uh, this had to be done online. Uh, so that's why, why I took this uh, example. I'm going to say more about that later. And then afterwards, we went back to the, the departments um, and to ask them, okay, what did we take away? from this exchange with the other departments and was, do we have to change our theory of change now for our department, for our projects? And uh, this is still running right now, this process. And um, this is all um, also looking ahead to the second half of the year. Like, is there anything we have to change um, about our planning for the second half of the year and beyond? And in this All House online workshop, what did we do? So this is going back to what, uh, the tools that um, that Dina mentioned also, and also like we had to, we were thinking um, 
very hard about how we could enable the kind of exchange that we wanted to have with 50 plus people online um, but still like allow for decentral you know individual or crossed up departmental exchange this is not so easy with the, with the tools that we have right now so we used zoom a central meeting space um, to have presentations from each department and also to have like reflection in um, small breakouts. Then we used Mintimeter and we might, uh, maybe we might try this later on. So you, you, can, you can see how this works for those of you who, who don't know yet. And um, we um, used uh, Microsoft Teams um for a uh, self-organized exchange so this was actually not ideal because we had this media break in a way you know we were on, on zoom everybody was there and then we asked everybody to change to teams which is really not ideal but we didn't really know how to enable it while staying in zoom because if we used if we had used zoom breakout sessions then people would have had to like go out of the session and then ask us to connect them to the next in MS Teams, we could create like different channels for each department and people could just hop in and out of, of those channels by themselves. Okay, so um, uh, first thing, um, what we did and what we learned was, um, you know, really um, do not think that everyone is a digital native. And so what we did when we started this uh, workshop, this all house workshop online was, uh, you know, uh, start with a little bit of humor and say, well, actually, you know, doing a three hour strategy workshop with 50 people online, this is not exactly what we had hoped for either. We would have preferred to meet, you know, and, and have a workshop uh, and on our premises together and see everyone and have a coffee together and so on. Um, but, you know, this is, this is just important to also see, you know, we're all in the same boat. But we, together, we can actually make it. Then um, we had, um, I'm going to show you just two examples of what we did offline in, in such a workshop where we look back at, like, at, at the year 2019 in December last year. We just used sticky notes on a wall, right? So this is probably something you're, you're uh, familiar with, like asking people, for example, like to, to, to see, okay, what's, what's the year 2019 in one word for you? What's been your highlight? What, what is the one thing that you've, you've learned that you want to take forward? Um, so online, we used Mentimeter. And we asked, for example, okay, what have I learned that I want to take further for the future? And, you, you know, this is just an example from us. So you see lots of people say, okay, they learn flexibility, prioritization, self-organization, uh, digital tools, etc. And a second example for what we did in a face-to-face -face workshop was, you know, we had this like different pitches and we had like little tables there and people, different departments were presenting their work. And then after that, there was like half an hour for people just to walk around, you know, um, uh, get into touch, get into conversations with their colleagues from other departments, asking follow-up questions, giving feedback. So online, what we did, as I said before, we went to over to Teams. We, we are using Microsoft Teams in the organization anyway, so people were familiar with that. And then we created like little channels for each um, each department, and so people could just like walk in and out of different conversations just at, as they had like on like at these tables. Um, yeah, so just uh, two slides of lessons learned. So facilitating the mid-year review. Um, as I said, take, uh, so what we learned is like really not everyone is a digital native and um, make it as easy as possible and show empathy. Remember the cat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then uh, second point, make people feel comfortable with the tech. So we invested a lot of time to actually prepare this so people would not, you know, have tech problems and use up the three hours that we had set aside for really like reflection and collective learning for tech problems. So we used the same cloud and the same like team channels and everything. We used the same stuff that, that, that we used during the workshop. We already asked people to prepare their, their uh, department um, presentations in that same infrastructure. So all the problems that, that came up, you know, they already came up before the workshop. We also did a briefing call with people who had like active roles in the workshop. So one day before the workshop, just to see that like they're, you know, uh, th those people had like a specific, a special briefing and they, they really knew how everything worked and they were feeling comfortable. 
And also we prepared a tagged info sheet, which was actually a lot of work step by step, like how to create, you know, how to join a call in, in Teams and so on. Also, one very important uh, thing that I, I think that that's, that's also learning that, that was helpful for us was to build distributed ownership for process and outcome in the organization. So we let people from all departments sign up for different worlds in the workshop. So they were like note takers, they were timekeepers, they were like uh, presenters, uh, they were like uh, people helping with the tech, um, they were people help, helping with virtual lunch afterwards. So they were like different people and all of us, you know, we felt ownership for the process and the outcome. So it's not just like one or two persons responsible for everything. And find a co-facilitator, big learning. It's easier and more fun for, for you yourself and for the participants as well. Um, because there are so many things that you have to take care of at the same time. And final thing, I think it was really important for us, even though we had this media break and it was like a bit complicated, to still have this opportunity for self-organized exchange. Um, because, you know, it's always important for people, especially now in these times of physical distancing and remote work, that they also reconnect with their colleagues and share what's important to them. Uh, yeah. And when it comes to the like impact uh, strategy um, overall, um, I think it's important to, um, or that's that's what, what I've learned also is really like take this take this purpose to heart, um, and and still do like invest a lot of time, especially now uh, into organizational learning, and then to ask your target group how have their environment and needs changed, to review your theory of change. So see your theory of change as a living document, um, as Dina said before, it's always the case, but now of course we really have like the, <laughs> the proof that it's uh, so helpful to do that. And um, also to ask yourself maybe, you know, maybe it's not the whole theory of change, not the whole strategy that you have to change, but it's more about tactics, you know, like short term, mid term tactics that you have to have to adapt. Um, set priorities. So what can be achieved under changed circumstances, also taking into account staff ex job, exhaustion, travel restriction, et cetera. So there are um, absolutely some things uh, that have to be, um, yeah, that maybe cannot be um, achieved and do it together. So right from the start, all of this, you know, try to get your team, partners, funders on board. Don't let anyone be surprised by the end of the year when they receive a report saying, okay, we couldn't any, actually do anything because of COVID. Um, yeah, just get them on board as early as possible. And also involve everyone because everyone has different uh, perspectives and maybe, you know, some people have, um, have heard something that, that might be a new opportunity that you haven't thought about. Yep. So this is it for me. Very short, uh, yeah, short, short uh, insight just from us. And I mean, we're very uh, curious to learn more from you. And also, you might have some questions. I don't know, um, uh, Dina. I see that there's uh, quite a lot of um, quite a lot, a lot of discussion in the in the chat. Would you like to share some of the questions that came up in the chat? So the chat has mostly been around uh, just uh, a lot of ideas for tech. Um, so John's been talking about, uh, you know, using pre-workshop and post-workshop preparation. So not all the events have to be in the same virtual space. You can do workshop work before as well as after. And you can ask groups to work together as well. So you bring together people only when it's the it's opportunity to really talk and share ideas. Um, also, you know, again, issues of bandwidth. If you're using whiteboarding apps like Mural, for example, it can yes. be quite tricky. Um, if you need, you know, it can be quite laggy. Um, so it's mostly been around to chat around that. Um, there was one question. Um, uh, uh, he was suggesting that you keep it small. Uh, if you've got sessions, you need to keep them small, small groups um, at first. There was one question yes. for you, uh, which was more about uh, whether you shifted your policy advice from group meetings or formats to bilaterals. Um, not that I know of. Events. Yeah, I, not that I know of, actually, because uh, we are a pretty events heavy house. So we have always had group meetings and events and background meetings and workshops and seminars and, uh, and so on, evening talks. Um, so, um, and we're still doing that. So we're just, we, we just try to shift it online. And, um, but we are going to see as we go into the second half of the year, people are still going to be, you know, so keen on 
joining uh, webinars and I think there the, the online space is uh, more and more crowded and we'll see um, but of course we've also had bilaterals so I think that not that I know that there has been any like change of prioritization in these two um, have you had that experience Katharina yeah I mean anyone's welcome to request the mic by the way if you want to say something um, you know Hans are you saying that you can't see how an organization can do this without lessons learned and reflection sessions Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna. Like I'm to gonna have that? Hans join us. Hans, you you got the the video and audio now. I think yes. So you're joining us. Yeah, I mean, I just think you know, I found it when I ran an organization. I really found it incredibly useful to think about how other organizations think about quality, yeah, and in other sectors. And I think we broadly understand what's happened, what has improved a lot of health systems, and. Yes, those things are not always very attractive, so to speak, the checklist idea that, you know, Ado Gavanda, uh, Ado Gavanda set out. But I mean, the, the many, many, many mistakes, and I see think tank papers, I would say, usually twice a month, sometimes more, uh, from different think tanks, and the mistakes are always the same ones. Yeah. Easily avoidable. It's researchers who think through a deductive structure mentally and then kind of push that deductive structure out onto an audience, which ideally should include ministers or deputy ministers. And then they're never going to read this thing because it's a deductive structure. It was a blog post that was extended into a paper. So what I'm trying to say, that's one thing. Yeah, I think that really understanding quality control and what I wrote there, as we know, what, what, you know, we know how Toyota works. We know why German car manufacturers that build great cars, where they learned it, they learned it in Japan. Yeah, it is Kaizen. It is constant, constant, tiny iteration cycles. And when I go into an organization and advise a think tank, I, I tend to ask what's, I mean, and not the top, but how do you capture the lessons? And I think if there's not a, if I don't hear that there's yes. a lessons learned process where the people sit together and which has to have one ritual and it is a ritual and it is fixed that the boss goes first and says everything that went wrong, this and this and this went wrong. And it was my mistake because I didn't resource you. I didn't brief you when you had a problem. I wasn't there to support you. And then everybody else can admit. But I mean, to me, this is, this is. I mean, this is something where I sometimes just scratch my head because we knew that. Yeah, it's a cultural know. thing as well, right? We knew it's about organizational culture. culture. Sorry, I'm, I'm done. Sorry for the long point. But I, I do think it's really <laughs> relative. And Dana, Dana, I sympathize with a lot of what you say. But I think what's key is that this is broken down into totally the normal workflow. So that, yeah, that's what I think where, where it really matters, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe I can just say, because I think that ties in a little bit with also what Katarina said. So the example that I showed you about this mid-year review workshop, it was not so much to show, um, you know, how we adapted on in internal formats. It's not events. It's it's exactly what, what Hans just mentioned. It is like, uh, it is a structure. It is a, a learning a process. So we had already set out before COVID came, you know, before we knew anything about this, Already end of last year, we put into everyone's calendar that in, on 10th of June, 2020, we're going to meet and we will talk about the second half of the year. So this is going to happen next year as well. It has nothing to do with COVID. But of course, we didn't set the topic to be so static. But, you know, when there was COVID, it was such a natural um, uh, thing to phrase the, the, the free reflection question. Uh, with regard to COVID, because, you know, what else? I mean, it was just, you know, logical to talk about this. But if if there was no COVID, we would still have uh, have, have had this ritual, you know, of having a mid-year reflection. And this is something that we are just building. It's like the first year that we're doing this. and we But we want to make this really a ritual that, like, every year in June and in December or November, we come together and we will look back and we ask like uh, the same questions maybe you know ask okay what are the competences that you that you acquired last half year um because i'm sure that all of us learned a lot and also what is you know the things that you want to take forward um and uh, you know also it's really really interesting to ask people just to share you know what's what's the last year in one word it's so interesting for our management for example i think this was really an aha moment because they saw like people wrote something like 
you know, I'm not going to show it to you because it's like, you know, uh, personal, like internal uh, thing. But, you know, many people wrote, okay, this was really exhausting, you know, exhaustion. It was like all over this like word cloud, you know. And for the management, it's so important to know this. And how are they going to know it if we don't ask it? So I think this is, you know, these kinds of questions, it's, it's very valuable. And it's so quick. You know, it's just like one minute, basically. Ask everybody to just put this in one word. And we will know so much about how the staff is doing, what we can actually expect from everyone in the next six months, and so on. So there, are there more, more questions? There's a, there's a Kaizen fan club happening on the side. <laughs> <laughs> the transfer of Japanese manufacturing practices to South Africa with team-based problem solving many years ago. <laughs> so I've been waiting for how many years 20 25 years for this discussion to come center stage so i'm really excited so <laughs> so next time next next online ott conference we're going to have a kaizen session i see but, that coming okay uh, are the there more the questions principles are the same um yeah anyone else who wants to talk about your experiences i mean i think we're going to move just now into into the collaborative whiteboard where we'll you know, talk about but i mean is anyone any questions about how to do this or concerns that you might have um or maybe anyone saying hey this doesn't make sense in my context at all like we're doing it totally differently or we don't need it you can request the mic or just write in a chat whatever you think so if you haven't already made your way over to the um presentation then i'm going to just pop that in the chat again uh, that link uh we want you to don't move there yet but just make sure you're up there just... i was wondering uh dina what do you think like should we do do, do all of you know mentee should we try that okay for a start all right we had and also that. And, uh, and also, actually, I saw that um, that Erica put up our poll question. So okay. I'd, I'd like you, it would be great if all of you could answer this poll question here on Hopin. Um, so the question is, um, for learning in your organization, are you or your organization doing lessons learned reviews after every research project? Not yet, sometimes, yes, often, yes, always. And uh, second question, in terms of organizational learning, COVID-19 has not changed much, reduced opportunities reflect about our work or allowed us to reflect about our work and its impact more. So these are two questions and you can answer them here on Hopin. It would be great for us because it's also, you know, we'll, we'll also learn more about uh, organization, no learning so in, in your that? organization. Where do we do that? Do we go where it says polls? And yes. Scroll down? So next to chat, uh, next to your chat, chat box, you see up there, there are like three tabs. It says like chat, polls, and participants or people. I think it's adapted to your language. For me, it's German, so I don't know exactly. Uh, yeah, chat, polls, and people, yeah. Okay, exactly. So there, you can head over there and just fill this in. And then, yeah, and then I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Dina again, who will start to show us, show us how Menti works for reflection purposes and organizational learning, and also you just ask you guys to, to contribute your thoughts. So I deleted the slide when we weren't going to do it, and I deleted them too efficient. I deleted it from the Google Doc, and it's all Google, so it's all gone. Hang on, I've got it. That's going to get it up again. I think we have it. We have it in the... In our agenda, right? I think I deleted it. Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, we'll just go to the slides right away. Right, I think I've got it, almost got it here. It's fun. If, has anyone not, has anyone, anyone here who hasn't used Mentimeter before, just say yes. So someone who would like to see it, is it something new for you? Okay, so I've okay. got the code. So if you go to W, let me see if I can, I've got the code. Yeah, so if you go to www.menti.com. Okay, I'll, I'll type that in the chat. www.menti.com. And then you type in the code 
Zero seven one five. Seven two seven. Seven two zero seven one five. Then you should get this um, opportunity to to answer the question. If the question is write one word that enters your mind when you hear the word learn. But now to share it with you, I have to try and go to my mentee. So I can see your responses. And I'll, it should look like this to you. Yeah. You can see it in the slide share. And then if you if you type in the, the code, you can answer a question. Yes. And this will get our collaboration started. Great. So I'll show the results to you once we move away from our, when we come back from our collaborative session. So if you can go and answer that word and I'll try in the meantime, get into the, where I can present back to you. Great. So um, what's a two by two output, John? Two times two output images. You want to elaborate on that? Two by two, oh, voting matrix feature on Menti is great. Oh, okay, prioritization matrix. Okay, so, so I mean, I think this is, I mentioned this earlier. I mean, one of the key tools we have in decision making is uh, prioritization. You know, we, we do brainstorming for divergent, for convergent, divergent thinking. We do, we have tools that we do for convergent thinking and these kind of organizing, also for sense making sessions. Um, you know, these kind of matrix prioritization voting sessions, they're really important and, and you, they can happen quite nicely and quite visually. Should we move over to the slides? Uh, so, do you want to show the re results already or later? Um, I'm still trying to sign in. It's, I think the, the screen is eating up a lot of my bandwidth. So it's, I'm trying to sign in it's very slow. Okay, we can do it later. So I'll bandwidth. just... Uh, I'll just share this, uh, this, uh, so you should all be able to see this Google, um, slide. Many people are there. We have lots of like anonymous, um, animals here. <laughs> <laughs> so Phil, so yeah, so basically what we want you to do is to just play around in this, imagine it's a whiteboard or it's a flip chart and you've all got a pen. Um, what, you know, what is it that you can learn from this crisis? How has it created? Or has it already created opportunities for organizational learning in your organizations for this idea of, you know, evaluation, review, synthesis, sharing across organizations? So type into the block, just, you know, you just says type here, you simply type, what have we learned from this crisis? And then what challenges remain? Um, and then, yeah, we'd just love to get a sense from you of, of what it is that can, um, You'd like to. So, I mean, for me, what we learned is that we needed to train our staff in virtual facilitation. Every, and we gave people turns, for example, to, uh, to produce and to facilitate for each other. So, Great, seeing so got a nice collaboration going there. If you don't have, uh, if you're using your phone, you can feel free to type into the chat and I'll type it into the slides for you. There's amazing tension in a crisis where learning and reflecting becomes almost more essential in organizations, but there is often even greater lack of time to dedicate to this when people are trying to practically respond to the crisis itself. Any innovative suggestions on how to overcome this challenge? So look, I think that's a great challenge. I know what we've done in our organization is we've created time to think. So we have a weekly a one and a half hour uh, kind of plan review and planning session. So the first thing we did is we, we set up a whole strategy for absolute over communication. Um, and we had like two times thinking pairs, a planning session on a Monday, a review session on a Friday, 
paddles for different projects, like quick huddle meetings. And we, we whittled it away as we didn't, as we, we found that was what wasn't really working, wasn't really necessary, or as people kind of got comfortable working more in the online space. And we've left, we've le we're left with a once a week plan and review. So review what worked the last week and plan the next week. And we get different staff to facilitate that every week. So they can come up with their own process, their own structure, and we use Zoom for that. Um, and then we, we have smaller huddles where just small teams meet when, as and when they need just to exchange information. And then we have these thinking pairs. So it's Nancy Klein's Time to Think thinking pairs where we pair people up. Um, and it can be either on a particular issue or just leave it open. And um, the idea there is you've got five minutes to just talk to another person without interruption. Um, so those are kind of two simple tools that we were using. And I think they really, people are really appreciate the connection that they get from those. Um, I'm gonna share this, the link to, to the Thinking Paris in the chat, it's great. I'll also look for that link for evaluation, learning questions. Great, some really nice ideas coming out. Another thing to think about, I don't know if any organizations have Google, but we're using Google Classroom for our online training. And it's actually a kind of a really nice, I suppose you might have it if you've got something like Slack or um, Microsoft Teams, where you can have a space to contain what's going on and contain the conversation. Ah, it's from framework, not from interact. That's why I can't find it. Learning questions. How are we doing this? So we seem to have slowed down a bit on the board. Um, anything, anyone else who wants to say anything or is it time for me to summarize? I think you can start summarizing and people can finish up while you're speaking. Okay, still looking for that. Uh, there's quite a lot of tools if you if you just Google learning agenda, learning framework, there's quite a lot of tools. I can't find this particular one that I, I know I found it the other day because I've been using it in a course, but now I have to search for it just now. We can um, we can send it to Kika later. Yeah, exactly. We can put it up in the chat or something. All right. So um, what are we finding? So in terms of learning from the crisis, has this crisis created any opportunities for organizational learning? Um, we are finding that, well, we needed to train everyone in virtual facilitation skills so that people could participate, facilitation, but also in the actual technology so people could participate. Mm -hmm, um, same here. Um, saving lots of time on travel. Yes. So it's kind of an opportunity. Um, but on the other hand, I was sitting here thinking like last night preparing my presentation thinking, I would have been doing this on the airplane. <laughs> Um, uh, instead of putting my kids to bed. So, 
Yeah, so lots of time, but I suppose our time, the, the, the challenge is that our time gets eaten up into, you know, work life bleeds into home life. That's the, I see on the challenges side, that's the alternative. Uh, um, how to work effectively remotely has been a huge lesson. I can absolutely see that. It's an opportunity to review who needs to work in the office and potentially offer even more flexible working arrangement. Absolutely. I was thinking of that yesterday, actually, because I've been working with a think tank, also similar to Claire's one in South Africa, very traditional, kind of established in the early 1900s, very resistant to any kind of flexi time or remote working. And I'm sure that this is going to be a huge opportunity for them to reconsider that. The young people have been asking for it. So I think it's it's been a huge eye opener for them. Um, Identify organizational values that had not previously been articulated. I think that's a nice one because people need a lot more permissions, I suppose. Um, can you pop into the chat? I'd love, okay, bye, Katharina has to go. Uh, thank you. Um, what, um, pop into the chat, you know, what do you, what do you mean by organizational values that are not, have you got any examples of that, that have come to the fore? Um, ability to work with fellows from all over the world that's been and a great thing I mean I think Claire actually mentioned to me in the up in the lead up to this session talking about how you know you it's created an opportunity to work with more think tanks around the world that you never thought you could work with before right uh, or because it, it seemed like you had yeah to it was open. It was almost weird, right? Because, I mean, we are foreign policy think tanks. We're working on international politics. And, like, I mean, these digital ways of like, getting in touch with international audiences, they have always been there. It's nothing new. But in a way, this, this crisis was, you know, a portal, <laughs> as this new uh, narrative says. So it really created, in a way, I don't know, just maybe the awareness that, that this was an opportunity and, or just, you know, everybody was more in front of their, of their computer anyways. And now all of a sudden, like, we're, you know, having more internet, we're reaching more international audiences than we have ever had before. Um, even though the, the, the opportunities happened there before the crisis. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, cr pressure creates diamonds, the opportunities, absolutely. Tech to support remote collaboration has been around for a while, but the human mindset behavior has delayed widespread adoption. So this is a great example that Claire just shared with us. Mm -hmm. um, that time spent with an organization in your country is very useful, but not always essential for every project. A useful learning experience of where it's nice to have, but not essential. Absolutely. What challenges remain? A lack of everyday interaction, uh, which often spark very good ideas. Absolutely. And I find, particularly if I'm doing an evaluation, it's often the time that you spend back in between interviews, off the record, or driving from one place to another with your host, where you, know, you can really find out what's really there going on hard to stay motivated, um, a lack of a third workspace between work and home, third space between, oh, you know, where you can think, like on the tube or driving home or on the bicycle, yes, absolutely, you have to take those moments to pause and reflect, um, you have to make the kettle break a bit longer, um, decisions get delayed or put off, firewood, firefighting eats up bandwidth, absolutely, preparation for an uncertain 2021, that's a challenge. What does it what does it mean going forward? And I think that's why we can probably only do short cycle planning right now. Uh, bal balancing relevance and mission focus and avoiding opportunism. So yes, we it is an opportunity to be opportunistic, but you don't want to be just tokenistically opportunistic. So I think that's absolutely important. Uh, defining or coping with the new normal. What does that mean uh, to us? Fear, uncertainty, doubt, consume emotional energy. There's a lot of emotional stuff. It's just also just tiring being at home every day need a bit of, you know, joy de vivre, that seems to be missing. Teams not getting to know each other socially, uh, absolutely. Uh, we've onboarded two new team members since we've been in lockdown, and it's really been hard to convey our organizational culture to them. Um, they feel like a lot of pressure to perform. We're, we're quite forgiving, and we, we like to talk through challenges. They feel like they need to figure it out on their own. All that kind of stuff has been really hard, and, and it's the tacit stuff. It's the implicit stuff that you forget to communicate uh, because you've never had to before about how do you learn and what's okay and to talk about, you know, reorganizing things and how can we replan if we've got an obstacle that they, they don't hear us talking about and, you know, overhear the conversations that happen between people. So they don't really get the culture. It's really been hard. 
Um, and also you don't maybe have the empathy because you don't have that connection with people. Um, and use this opportunity to build regional strength, quality number of bonds with think, within think tanks. Um, yeah, that's a, a great opportunity that remains. Um, Hans is saying yes, but the reality is we, what's that too? Which comment is that too? Oh, socially, yes, but the reality is we really do not know how this will work out if it lasts longer, as if it may well be even more of a marathon rather than a sprint. So what you're saying in response to short-term planning, yes, we, we might need to think. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah's saying they did an online quiz on Zoom to try and keep the work social going in the virtual office. It's a great idea. We did a pub quiz as well. It was fun. So we have a monthly uh, connect, also which we also rotating between the staff members. Team connect. We started uh, where you know people come with their cake and coffee or whatever it is, and uh, we last time. Yeah, we we've had after work drinks as well. We had like people wearing funny hats in front of their cameras and stuff. And and we played on virtual games like Hangman. So it's been <laughs> it's been quite fun. So you can do that. It's really important to keep that connection going um, on a fun level and on a spiritual level as well. Okay, um, let's go back to hop in. Let's move off the slide. So if you move, go back to your hop in screen um, and then we can close or uh, just move to the last thing. We would like to talk about We'd really like to keep this uh, session going, uh, this conversation going with you. And in fact, uh, we have been talking for some time now about setting up with on think tanks a community of practice for monitoring, evaluation, and learning in think tanks. And Claire and I are using this as an opportunity to launch this uh, community of practice now. It's really, um, as you can see from that cartoon, there, everyone has a different idea or understanding of what a, what a COP is or could be. Um, and we certainly don't have that defined yet. We have a, uh, we're going to be driving it for now, but it's going to be part of the On Think Tanks community of practice, which is something they're setting up as part of their also 10th anniversary celebrations. So it's still a rough concept. We invite all of you to join us to help shape it. Uh, we thought we'd have the first meeting around the end of July, uh, early August. And if you're uh, wanting to participate in that, um, how can you sign up for the COP? That's the Very good question, Hi. Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this indicates some first interest. So just so, uh, yeah, as, as, as Dina said, so uh, we don't really know yet what shape this, this community of practice or COP will take, but... Just uh, some first ideas that we've had in the run up to this today is just that, you know, we find it so valuable to share um, ideas, good practices, also just maybe questions that none of us has like really an answer to connected to a building organizational, um, building a learning organization. So as a think tank, you know, we're a learned organization. We are, you know, dealing with knowledge. We are basically saying that we have, you know, we're a bit ahead of the curve. We know more uh, or we know better and you know the question is how are we also becoming learning organizations how can we build this what what Dina said earlier this culture of learning this culture of talking about mistakes this culture of you know being humble and and and, and applying this critical eye not only to the world around us but to us ourselves but in a very you know a very collegial way I'm um, not in you know in an overly critical way but in you know in a supportive way so we want to you know keep this conversation going in the attempt to learn from each other and um, just just support each other and it could be that you know we might have just a monthly call to do this um, maybe over coffee you know it can be fairly informal we could also um, you know think about if we want to um, maybe um, uh, uh, publish something together on the on think tanks blog um, uh, also for the, the, the upcoming conferences you know we might uh, create a session like this one with like more of you involved and think about what you know what can we take from this like crisis year forward um, yeah so th these are just some ideas that, that Dina and I had in the run up to this and we would love for you to to sign up 
and there's uh, the, the possibility to do so after the conference. So it's not necessarily not necessary to have been part of this session here now to join, but you can, uh, Enrique will send out more info on how to join the communities of practice after the conference and everyone has the chance to, to join and we will, you know, decide together how we want to go forth. I've shared just the, for now I'm offering the services of our receptionist. She will, uh, Morita, her name's Mo at Southern Hemisphere, and she'll just record, keep everyone's names together for us. And Perfect. So, and then I think I've put it into the next slide. So mm -hmm. if you want to just look at that, uh, Claire, um, if you, I don't know if there's any questions about the community of practice or we could just finish off. You can summarize the session. But I also wanted to know from people if you could just write as a, you know, as a brief summary instead of us summarizing, you know, what are your key takeouts from the session today? So put that in the chat or um, take the mic. What are your key takeouts about organizational learning and how you can adapt and become more resilient organizations uh, in order to make sure that you're, you know, you're achieving the impact that you want to achieve? Um, what are your key takeouts from the session today? Please write away in the chat because these chats will also help us to document later. Yes, absolutely. And also if there are like any questions already or topics that you would like to, you know, talk on in, in one of the later sessions or if you already know that you want to join for sure, you can write it in the chat right now so we know. Claire, for you, what was your drive home message that you were hoping people would leave with today? So uh, for me, it's really this like uh, two kinds or modes of learning. Like, as I said, uh, learning despite the crisis, keep learning what you had before. If you had like maybe after action reviews before, if you had like yearly staff meetings to reflect upon, you know, the, the last year or plan the next year, keep doing it because it will just uh, help you um, to uh, to keep up to date and, and monitor important um developments uh, and then also learn from the crisis and we've seen like a, an example from how RSA helps their staff to do so um, because I think there are so many interesting developments for example also in the relationship between science and politics um, or in uh, how think tanks can actually get their message across in a crowded environment so um, really also try to learn from the crisis and think about also what are the good things that we want to take forward and what are good things that we are just very happy to return to back in like the new normal, so to say. So really like uh, uh, keep keep learning and, and, and enhance learning because this is such, a, such an important um, point in time to be alive and to really um, take home some messages for, um, for your organization weathering the storm. Rebecca's saying that uh, you used the term agile management on one of your slides. And coincidentally, she's just started exploring whether we would benefit from agile principles to be more fit for purpose for the current and future operational environment. So it's good to know that you're on the right track. Yes, it sounds like you are on the right track. I mean, do you want to say more about agile management, Claire? Um, yeah, I think it's been like a bit of a buzzword and, and I'm not sure if we, because we have like five more minutes, I think, to, to join the general recap. Um, but maybe as people are, uh, are, are writing down other, um, other takeaways that are, that they are taking home. Um, I mean, it's, it's a buzzword. It's, um, it's, uh, it's been used in different ways, but I think it's, it's just about like not having to, it's, it's this, what I said in the beginning, and maybe I can return to that slide. It's like, like really um, about uh, trying to find this sweet spot between um, you know this like inflexible strategy uh, where you're just like trying to deliver on whatever you promised like um, a year ago or even two or three years ago when you um, when you when you asked the funder for money uh, and then um, and then on the other hand like this like uh, you know super hasty crisis management from day working from day to day and um, I think for here really for for agile um, uh, methodologies and project management it's just very important that you have these like short sprints 
in a way to uh, to be able to adapt and to always learn and do these like after action reviews after uh, events for example after project cycles and to apply what you've learned to the next one and what's also important is that it's also connected to knowledge management because uh, if you talk about it and you document it what you've learned then it, this is also accessible for example if one of your team members leaves the organization and another one comes on board it's uh, not such a big problem because you won't lose so much um, uh, in, because you've externalized their knowledge in a way and you've made these lessons learned um, accessible to future team members. So, I mean, about agile management, I'm certainly, like, there are probably certainly people who are more of experts on this and or we could do also a separate session on this, but I think it's just important to see that this is absolutely, in my mind, a, an important um, way to go uh, for, for think tanks and we can learn a lot from these uh, methodologies. I think I saw recently something about don't be over, don't like let agile break down what's, don't, don't kind of be too agile and break down what's already working, something like that. So just like, I think some critiques are starting to emerge as well. So as you said, it's about the sweet spot. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's absolutely critical. So um, Emilia is saying that's been really useful because as a think tank, a new emerging think tank, they can talk about uh, generating ideas on how they can start well, create a thinking culture from the beginning and very useful tools in order to collaborate digitally. Well, if, that's how, if we've started you on that track right now, then that's great. That's awesome. Uh, it, it really is. Um, it's it's not easy. I think people, um, it, as I said, it is a muscle. You know, that's my my message. It, it, it is a muscle that that needs to be developed. And um, people's kickback or default position is often let the bosses do the thinking. Um, and and it is something that one really needs to encourage and create the spaces for and empower people through. As Claire said, you know, giving people opportunities to take on different roles. Um, as I said, you know, give, let people give them the skills to to think critically and also just the skills to manage the processes um, and create those opportunities. And I'm sure it's going to be amazing. And people really, once people start realizing the power of critical engagement, then you can't stop it. So once the doors are open and people have the permission um, and they take ownership, then it's really a powerful process. I and think it's really about allowing ourselves. Keep yeah, I was just thinking. Sorry, I didn't hear. Go ahead. No, I was just thinking that it's really about like allowing ourselves to, you know, just say what we've thought already, because I think many people are already critical also of processes because most of us, you know, we are self-driven. We want to have an impact. This is why we want to, why we get up every morning, go to work, right? And why we chose to work in a think tank and not maybe in, you know, a, a university and, um, and I think uh, it's more about like, how can we actually reinforce this, like, and allow each other and ourselves to also voice this and then like see it as a constructive contribution to organizational development and not as like, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, I don't know what, Nestbeschmutz, I don't know. There's a German word for someone who's critiquing their own, you know, home in a way, their own nest. And this is like a negative uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And I think like we have to get away from that mindset and really be open. And I don't know, maybe uh, Ina, Dina, if we're for the end, you would like to, or if it's possible to share the mentee results, just to oh, see, yeah. to show everyone right. uh, how this like individual reflection with staff can actually be done digitally. Okay. It's very easy as yes, you yes, 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 oh, yes. you don't screen. Uh, okay, I've got them. Forgot about it completely. Okay, I was so involved in the discussion. So I need to share my screen one. Share. There it is. So we didn't have only had eight people participating. But can you see it? Yes. We only had eight people participating in the mentee, but uh, improvement is a big word. So learning means improvement. It's new skills, exchange, always, oh, always learning. Uh, what? Learning what? <laughs> What's working? Uh, it's a good one. Time, it takes time, it's work. Interesting, I mean, those are great answers. A lot of people, when I do this exercise, you know, we'll talk about things like school, tests, assignments exactly. and so learning can have quite a 
traumatic, yeah, traumatic connotation for a lot of people as well. And I think we're trying to encourage a move away from that to something that is dynamic and, and fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And that can help you to achieve that impact that makes you get out of bed every morning. Mm -hmm. So that's... So that's it, basically. Um, just uh, what we did today, just as a quick review. So we had short, uh, two short inputs um, from, from Dina and I sharing uh, something about what is organizational learning, why is it important for think tanks. Um, I, um, I shared some stories from how we try to adapt our impact strategies to go beyond crisis management mode in my organization, how we used um, organizational learning practices that we are still establishing right now this year, but have been planning before we knew about COVID, how, how we actually try to take this online. Dina sh uh, shared with you like a whole list, a whole table, and we will make this accessible later uh, as well um, of like tools that we can use um, online to uh, support individual reflection, reflection in departments about what has to change in our strategies. Um, and also um, for uh, for the whole organization, how you can maybe you know learn learn from from how, what we did uh, to to do an all staff workshop online, uh, so you don't do the same mistakes that that we did. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. It was really interesting. We had like quite a lively chat discussion going on. We had collaboration in Google Slides, and we had a Mentimeter. Um, uh, Mentimeter survey and a poll. You can still participate in the two hop in poll questions. Uh, and uh, of course, this will be visible to everyone. Everyone, also people who haven't been part of this session, can um, answer the hop in poll. So maybe after the conference, we will see you know how organizational learning is established in in, the, in different think tanks around the world and what it well how how is it being affected by by COVID nineteen and the, and the changes that brought um, for us. Um, yeah, um, Dina and I are very much looking forward to, to uh, keeping this conversation going with all of you. So we hope that many of you will um, will be interested and in, in, will be keen to join our community of practice and uh, our first meeting where we will discuss how we want to work together to um, yeah to to just keep learning from uh, other think tanks around the world.